Hey everybody and welcome to another episode of How I Built It, the podcast that asks, how did you build that? Today, my guest is Thomas Umstadt. He's a plugin and agency owner who's had great success in crowdfunding his products. It's a fantastically interesting take and he offers lots of great advice. This is definitely one of my favorite conversations because I learned a ton. Let's talk about all of that after a word from our sponsors. This season of How I Built It is brought to you by two great sponsors. The first is LiquidWeb. If you're running a membership site, an online course, or even a real estate site on WordPress, you've likely already discovered that many hosts have optimized their platforms for a logged out experience where they cache everything. Sites on their hardware are great for your sales or landing pages, but struggle when your users log in. At that point, your site is as slow as if you were on $3 hosting. Liquid Web built their managed WordPress platform optimized for sites that want speed and performance, regardless of whether a customer is logged in or logged out. Trust me on this. I've tried it out and it's fast. Seriously fast. Now, with their single site plan, Liquid Web is a no-brainer for anyone whose site is actually part of their business and not just a site promoting their business. Check out the rest of the features on their platform by visiting them at buildpodcast.net slash liquid. That's buildpodcast.net slash liquid. It's also brought to you by Jilt. Jilt is the easiest way to recover abandoned shopping carts on WooCommerce, Easy Digital Downloads, and Shopify. Your e-commerce clients could be leaving literally thousands on the table, and here's why. 70% of all shopping carts are abandoned prior to checkout. Yes, you heard that right. 70% of shoppers never make it to checkout. That's why you need to introduce your clients to Jilt. Jilt uses proven recovery tactics to rescue that lost revenue. It's an easy win that lets you boost your client's revenue by as much as 15%, and it only takes 15 minutes of your time to set up. Jilt fully integrates with WooCommerce, EDD, and Shopify. You can completely customize the recovery emails that Jilt sends and match your client's branding using its powerful drag and drop editor. Or you can dig into the HTML and CSS. Even better, Jilt's fair pricing means your clients pay only for the customers that actually engage. You get to earn a cut of that through Jilt's partner program. Whether you have clients that process one sale per month or 10,000 sales per month, be the hero and help them supercharge their revenue with Jilt. Check them out at buildpodcast.net slash Jilt. That's buildpodcast.net slash J-I-L-T. And now, on with the show. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of How I Built It, the podcast that asks, how did you build that? Today, my guest is Thomas Umstadt. Thomas, how are you? Doing great. Thanks for having me. Hey, thanks for being on the show. Uh, so Thomas reached out and asked about being a guest on the show. And then we realized that we had met about four years ago in Austin uh, for a cigar while well, WordPress event and then subsequently a cigar event following the WordCamp. So very cool to reconnect with you. Uh, and we're going to be talking about crowdfunding, specifically crowdfunding a plugin today. Is that right? That's right. Cool. So uh, why don't we start off with uh, who you are and, and what you do? So my name is Thomas Umstadt, and I run Author Media. Uh, back in the day, we focused on building websites for authors. We were a WordPress agency, and we were relatively early to the WordPress world. I think we got started in WordPress 2.3, 2.4. And one of the challenges that we found that we kept running into was authors that had lots of books. So when you have two or three books, you just create web pages for them. But what do you do for an author who's got 40 books and there's different genres? And what we started developing was a plugin just to make our own lives better, which was to create post types and taxonomy. So you can like click on the romance genre and see all of the books by that author in that genre and even additional authors. And about that time, the industry went through this big transition away from traditional publishing. So authors used to get a check for $5,000 for their book. And now most of them have moved to self-publishing where they pay $5,000 or (laughs) $3,000 to publish their book. And what got squeezed out 
in that window was their website budget. <laughs> so suddenly authors are like, I don't want to pay somebody to build my website. I'm spending all my money on editors and cover yeah. designers and all of this. And so we were like, what do we do? So our whole business model was based off of, you know, people getting these checks from their publishers and spending some of that on a website. And we had had a lot of people asking for our plugin that we developed internally. People would see sites we'd done for our clients. They're like, man, that's amazing. I want that kind of functionality on my WordPress site. And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> this this is a lot of work. <laughs> and, and I don't want to build this plugin and like five people buy it and us lose us right. all, all this money. And so we put it on Kickstarter. And so we were, I think, the second or third ever WordPress plugin on Kickstarter. And wow. we put it, we had a goal of $2,500 and we had a bare bones version of our plugin, like a core functionality to make it, you know, work with other themes that weren't our own, uh, you know, in-house framework we were working with. And, you know, we were like, what do you want world? Do you want this plugin? <laughs> tell us you <laughs> want it. Cause you can ask somebody, Hey, I've got this idea. What do you think? And people will always tell you it's a good idea. But of if course, you, of course. <laughs> but if you ask them, Hey, would you like to pre-order a copy of the plugin for 50 bucks or $25? Then they're like, oh, well, it's not that good of an idea. Or they're like, right. oh, my gosh, it's amazing. Shut up and take my money. And we wanted to see what kind of reaction we got. And we put it on Kickstarter. And I think within two, two and a half weeks, we hit our goal. We're like, wow, nice. this is really exciting. And we still had a couple of weeks left with our campaign our, on Kickstarter. And so we started adding features from our wish list of features as stretch goals. Like, well, we've got Barnes Noble and Amazon, but if you want buttons to these other stores, we need to hit three thousand or thirty five hundred dollars and then five thousand. And we kept going, then we hit ten thousand dollars of our original so our goal was originally twenty five hundred dollars. Wow. We're at ten thousand dollars. And this one person really wanted us to add a feature. I don't remember what it was, but they were from Germany. And they spent thirty minutes on our last day sending Twitter messages to every single person on Twitter that had WordPress in their bio. Just one after another, they were handcrafting these messages. And I was simultaneously like really honored that this person would put in all of this work and also horrified that they're spamming Twitter on our behalf. <laughs> <laughs> like, we have nothing to do with this guy. I mean, yeah, we like yeah. him. And I was like, I now understand how political candidates work. <laughs> <We're> like, <laughs> I like the support, but I don't necessarily want to be associated with these crazy people. And so at the end of the day, I think we ended up raising, I think, around $12,000 for our plug-in. And that gave us uh, the money to really invest in making it the best plugin we, we could for authors. And we launched our plug when we finally released it. You know, our Kickstarter backwards are the first ones to use it. And we let them have early access, which was a great way of having people pay us to be beta users. And so they gave us all kinds of feedback and requested features. And we're like, oh, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. And we added those features into it. And uh, over the years, we've you know continued adding features. We had that long head start in a sense and a couple of years ago we actually did a second kickstarter for my book table three and raised another twelve thousand dollars our users are used to backing us on kickstarter i guess i don't think it was quite yes. twelve thousand the second time i don't remember exactly the numbers but it was really encouraging it was a great way to test the idea ahead of time yeah that's fantastic so quick follow-up on that i mean we're going to talk all about crowdfunding but you said that like you hit your goal and then you started adding features and then like you jumped from 2500 in like two weeks to 10 that or 12,000 by the end. Do you think those stretch goals made a difference? Like those stretch goals were the thing that people were like, oh, yes, that is what I'm willing to pay for. Absolutely. We had stretch goals, some of which were features people really, really wanted. And gotcha. this, again, is where we were able to develop the plugin kind of in collaboration with our future users and because we were able to f hear from them what they wanted we were interacting and we could see oh people are really excited about this feature they're not excited about this other feature and you know when someone's spamming twitter on your behalf because they really want to unlock a stretch goal that allows them to interface with the store that they use and it's like okay yeah. this person really cares and what's interesting is that you find a software development not everyone cares about all the features equally Right. So you have this feature and a very small but vocal minority of your users really care about that. Well, crowdfunding is a way for them to put their money where their mouth is in a sense and be like, OK, if you want to add that feature, we need you to help us get to this goal. And so they're sharing the word and talking to other authors. And we also incentivized people to back the campaign in that if you backed the Kickstarter, you got the plugin at a discount. So it would, the retail price was higher than what you could pre-order it for. And it allowed us to have the money ahead of time. And so we didn't have to get a loan from the bank or investors or take money away from our other operations. Yeah, I mean, that that's the real beauty of Kickstarter, right? And I feel like, so first of all, with Kickstarter, I don't know how many 
people listening who have backed a Kickstarter project, but generally you're like pre-ordering something that doesn't exist yet. That's essentially what you're doing on Kickstarter. And uh, you'll have a amount of time to get the funding you want. It's all or nothing on Kickstarter. So if you don't reach your goal, you don't get any money and people aren't charged. And then you set a date, essentially. All right, well, you know, we'll have it by May 2018 or whatever. And especially in manufacturing, especially in Kickstarter projects that just completely blow their goal out of the water, there's a delay of at least six months, right? So Kickstarter has gotten a little bit of a bad rap because... You know, I paid for this thing and then it's taking me forever to get it. But with software, you don't necessarily run into that, right? You don't have to deal with, like, scaling manufacturing or anything like that, right? That's right. We had to add the additional uh, features that everyone, want, you know, unlocked, so to speak, with their stretch goals. But it wasn't like manufacturing. It's like, wow, we were planning on making 100 units, but now we have to make 10,000 units. We need to find more factories in China. It wasn't like that at all. So that was nice. And we did launch on time. Part of the advantage is we had a head start in the sense that we'd already built a working version of it that we used internally. And so we weren't right. starting from scratch. Although it ended up basically feeling like starting from scratch because there are so many different WordPress themes out there. And some of them are coded very badly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, like yeah. having a plugin that interacts with themes and working with them all is almost impossible. So we work with the top themes. So if you have nice. some obscure theme you downloaded from Theme Forest that you really like, it may or may not work, which is why we have the refund We're like, and a free version. So today, the plugin's still free. Most of our users use the free version. There's a pro version that has some extra features, but it allows us to kind of, people who, it's not going to work in their environment, they can find that out for free. Gotcha. That's cool. So that, that makes a lot of sense. And just again, before we get into like the weeds of, of crowdfunding, I'm really interested in, in the niche that you chose, right, which was author media. Can you tell us a little bit about, like, how you chose authors as your main clientele? Yeah, I was at a writer's conference with a book I was actually wanting to write. And I went to the obligatory marketing talk. And I'd been building websites since I was 13 years old. So I was very familiar with websites. And I'm in this marketing talk, and the lady giving the talk is like, you have to have a website, you have to have a blog. And all of the authors are looking around terrified. And they're like, who do we call? How, you know, how do we get help with this? And the lady who was giving the talk had found some like high school student who is an intern who has set up all of her stuff. And she's like, oh, just find a five-year-old in your neighborhood. It's it's no big deal. <laughs> and everyone's like, I don't know a five-year-old in my neighborhood who can build me yeah. a website. And so I didn't know anything at the time. So I just turned to the author next to me because this is my first writer's conference. I was like, wow, she's a real author. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll build you a website for free. No problem. Just, you know, as a friend. And she loved it. And she recommended me to all of her author friends. And I charged them. <laughs> and yeah. my next writer's conference I went to, I just printed out a brochure for websites. And again, this was in the days where ever, all these authors were getting big checks from publishers. And right. I had authors I'd never met before writing me checks at writers conferences for websites. And wow. part, part of it was that I was way underpriced at the time because I didn't know what the market was. So they were all getting crazy deals and they knew it and I didn't. But yeah. I realized that it was an untapped market. And there's actually a really powerful business principle here. In many ways, authors aren't any different from any other kind of business, but they think they're different. And because mm -hmm. they think they're different, they want to be treated differently. And so you can give them entirely the same advice that a business, small business would get. But what we did is we had this blog and it was marketing advice and social media advice for authors. It's the same fundamental principles you'd get on some big blog. But because we were tailoring it for authors and using examples of authors, we were able to be in Writer's Digest and all of these other lists of best websites for authors because the niche wanted something exclusively for them. And there are tens of thousands of niches online that want somebody to say, we're just for you. And what's interesting is that back when we were doing websites, it didn't keep us from doing small businesses. Authors would have us do their website for their writing. And then they're like, oh, by the way, I'm a financial advisor. Or I've got a such right. and such company. Can you build my website for that? And we're like, okay, because we, they were getting a really great deal because we were so cheap. Right, um, right. So, you know, some, some lessons were learned there. But the other thing is that having that niche, it made it really easy for us to design the software. 
Right. We could have built something like, because my book table is, is it's an e-commerce platform without the e-commerce. So mm-hmm. instead of buying from your store like you would with WooCommerce, it's got a button that sends you to Amazon or a button that sends you to Barnes & Noble. Right, we right. very easily could have been like, this is for any kind of product. You can sell CDs here. You can sell DVDs here. But by focusing it on just books, it allowed us to make it a lot easier to use. And it allowed us to know who we were designing the software for specifically. We had specific authors who had specific problems and we were wanting to solve their problems. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, like that is excellent advice, right? You, you can take the things that you've learned generally, and if you apply them to an industry, you're at least making the attempt to have some domain knowledge to understand the problem that your client is trying to solve. And that's what people want. You know, you know, somebody can go to Squarespace and just make a website, but Squarespace doesn't understand the problem they're trying to solve. A person understands the problem you're trying to solve. So that is excellent advice. And I will say, this is not, so. I wish I had thought of this because I am a published author. I got a big fat check from a publishing company, like in advance. And and let's just say they're very smart about the advance that they give you. Like it's probably going to shake out. At least I didn't see a royalty check, right? I like, they give you the advance and they're like, this is, this is how much you're going to make on the book. (laughs) But I mean, a website can help that. Right. And, and uh, my, my book was very niche, but I am a web developer. So I'm like, I'll just make a website. Like the publisher was like, you should probably have one. And I'm like, obviously I should have one. I make one. It's about making websites. Um, (laughs) (laughs) So not WordPress powered though, funnily enough. This is just like a static page. So anyway, let's get back to crowdfunding, right? So Kickstarter requires a lot of information up front to, to make sure that, you know, you're not just some guy trying to get some money for like potato salad, which by the way is a real Kickstarter. So what kind of research did you do and what kind of research went into making a good Kickstarter page that got you, you know, five times, right? Five times or so what you were asking. Yeah, so we we did it wrong at first. In fact, if you go to our original My Book Table Kickstarter page, you can find it if you Google for it. The initial video, we did everything wrong. Basically, I had a friend who's a videographer, and I was like, just film me for 30 minutes and pick the top five minutes worth of information about the plugin. It's a total disaster. I felt so bad for him. He had this huge editing job, and I was totally incoherent. But as the campaign was getting speed, uh, one of the things we did is we created an explainer video. This is back when explainer videos are really popular. It was one of these little mm-hmm. cartoons that kind of explained how the plugin uh, worked yeah. and, and what it did. And that we still use that video actually and it's been very helpful to kind of explain here is what an affiliate program is. Here's how this plugin integrates with my Amazon affiliates to help you get paid twice, once from your publisher and once from Amazon and, and things like nice. that. But the most important thing if I could give a single piece of advice is to know who your audience is. So since we'd already been working with authors in real life, we knew exactly who they were, like how old they were, what you know their genders were in general, and we could craft it for specific people. And that's really valuable. When I, I recently you know, restarted up this business, I, I took a break. I was a marketing director at a marketing firm for a while. And when I got back, I, I just gave away a bunch of free consultations to authors just to get re-familiarized with the kinds of problems they were having now. Because the problems they're having last year aren't the same problems they're having now. And so they were getting advice from me. And I was, you know, because I have things I can teach them. But I was also learning from them because the Mm -hmm. kinds of questions they were asking were very, very valuable. And so I think it's very important to be very close to your end user. And one way that people do this is they create software that scratches their own itch. And I think that that's good. And in a sense, we did that. But It's also important to have specific people you're coding for. So we have this one lady. She's probably a 60-year-old author. She uses our plugin. She has a not that attractive theme. She's not that sophisticated. The best piece of software on her website is our plugin. (laughs) And every time we make a decision about a feature, we ask, what would this lady think? (laughs) Her name's Barbara. And we're like, what would Barbara do? You know, would she know how this feature works? And typically, if I'm having a discussion with a developer... Whoever can invoke the name of Barbara best wins the debate. Because ultimately, <laughs> the plugin's not for me. The plugin's not for him. The plugin is for Barbara. She's the one who's going to be using it. She's the one who has to be happy with the plugin ultimately. And so, what that's meant for us is that we've had to work really hard to make the plugin as easy to use as possible. 
and some cool features, we have to you know find ways of either making decisions instead of options, which is a part of the WordPress philosophy. And we mm-hmm. found that that's really important and almost impossible to do if you don't know who you're developing your software for. And when you have a specific person that you're trying to thrill, then it makes it a lot easier to make those decisions. Awesome. So you have, uh, Barbara is your user story, right? In, in software engineering, you talk about user stories. You craft these personas that are your ideal users. Uh, and it's fantastic that you have a real life one that probably could not be more different from the developers creating the software, right? Oh, she grew up in it. When she grew up, there was, you know, threat of nuclear bombs and Mm -hmm. the TVs were in black and white. And her experience with technology is just a totally different experience with technology than somebody who's never known. Because my developer is this, you know, young, you know, bright uh, tech guy who's never known a time when he didn't have the answers to every question in his life in his pocket. Right, (laughs) right. Fundamental difference. That's so funny that you say that, right? Like my parents' generation, like technology was like a looming threat, like a horrible thing. And like, sure, there are threats with technology today, but like the good, uh, I think, outweighs the bad, which is so interesting. That's fantastic. So you made this video and you also have to list. So how long ago was this? I know that at some point in Kickstarter's history, you also had to add the risks of the project. To say like, hey, we understand that we're not just taking your money and it's going to be like sunshine and rainbows, that there could be problems. So did you have to evaluate those risks? Yes. And you, as far as I know, you still have to do that on Kickstarter yeah, today. You right. have to list the risk. And we listed some risks. The primary risk, I think everyone should list this if they're doing a Kickstarter, is that the project will be delayed. Mm-hmm. People tend to be overly optimistic about the future, especially developers, software developers, that because they think that technology is good and things are getting better, they're like, oh, yeah, the future is going to be rainbows and butterflies. And the reality is that Murphy also gets a vote on how your software development <laughs> goes. And, you know, the new version of WordPress comes out and some of the functionality doesn't work anymore and you have to figure out how to accommodate it. The other thing that's really important, though, is with making a Kickstarter work. It's not just having a good video. It's also having reward levels that are rewarding. Mm -hmm. So if, if your reward levels are buy the thing now that you could buy later, why would they buy the thing now? (laughs) So you have to, there has to be some extra thing that they get. And one of our most popular levels was you get to be the demo book in the demo bookstore that people install when they're figuring out how the plugin works, Uh, which was a really fun reward. Yeah. That's and a very smart reward, it's too. It's a really smart reward. And, and the people, 12 people backed at that reward is $250. So it was a pricey reward. But now, five years later, they're having their book installed. When somebody installs my book table, and it's like, would you like to install demo books? You know, we could have very easily picked, like, Catcher on the Rye and To Kill a Mockingbird, right. a bunch of classic books, Lord of the Rings. In fact, in the demo version, that is what we had. We were like, hey, this is an opportunity. We can install other people's books and... You know, the author of Writing Fiction for Dummies, Rainy Inger Manson, backed our campaign. So now he gets his book, Writing Fiction for Dummies, installed right there at the top, which, you know, I think is a good market for him. <laughs> building, Absolutely. Building their book websites. And so, that you know, that was one of our levels. We had another level that was lifetime free support and free updates. So we had, you know, and that was $150. Those people have ended up getting a great deal, though, because they have gotten, they got my book table one for free. They got my book table two for free. They got my book table three for free. And, you know, they believed in us early. And as a way of saying thank you, it's like, hey, you're taking a risk on us that this is going to be something that's going to be worth having, you know, five years from now. They got a really great deal. And then as we had, we did other Kickstarters for other products. One of the other things we started doing is bundling. So, you know, you get, we had another one called My Book Progress, which lets you put a progress bar on your website and get email subscribers to your MailChimp campaign. And at one of the levels, you also got the paid version of My Book Table. So we were able to cross sell our products. So each Kickstarter nice. cross sold our other Kickstarters and at big discounts. And it creates a sk- sense of urgency and scarcity. And without really cannibalizing your regular sales, because somebody who's just come to your website isn't going to like, oh, I wonder if these people have a Kickstarter and they're going to your Kickstarter, right? Right. Because they're for your like core fans. It's a way of rewarding your core fans and basically saying, hey, thank you for following us on Twitter. Here's a link to our Kickstarter campaign. Man, that's that's really interesting. So I wonder how well the demo books converts for your authors. Like, I wonder if like the Fiction for Dummies author has feels he made his money back on that investment 
I, I don't know if there's a way for him to tell, but I'm just curious. That's really funny. Yeah. And so that brings me to another question, right? Is that you continually do these Kickstarter campaigns, right? So there's some criticism of, don't worry, I'm not going to like nail you to the wall here. I'm just kind of thinking out loud. I'm not like, this is not like Nancy Grace. <laughs> so uh, there's been criticism of companies that only rely on Kickstarter, right? But it's been very good to you, right? It's almost like having a... Uh, like a very easy pre-order mechanism with some more fun rewards, right? Because pre-order is just like, give me money now and I'll give you a thing later. But Kickstarter, it's like, give me money now. And also here's here's a little something extra for supporting me early. Right. What I like about Kickstarter is that it turns it more into an event and mm-hmm. it provides some kind of third-party validation. So if we put on our website, 200 people have backed this project, they may or may not believe us, right, depending mm-hmm. on our relationship with them. But if our project is on Kickstarter and says 200 people have backed us, well, they trust Kickstarter. Kickstarter is a neutral third party. And we did it both ways. My book table 2, we just launched normally. We didn't do a Kickstarter. And it wasn't nearly as much fun. People didn't back it. Not everyone mm-hmm. saw it. It didn't, you know, people didn't upgrade to it as quickly. It, it wasn't as successful of a launch. And it didn't have that interactive element because part of what's fun is that during those 30 days, you're getting tons of feedback from your users. You're seeing what they're posting. It's building this anticipation and this excitement. And they're like, hey, can you add this? Can you add that? And we didn't have that with our version 2 launch, which is why we went back and launched version 3. I know a lot of people shy away from relaunching products on Kickstarter because they don't want to share because Kickstarter takes a cut in addition to the credit card fee. But I find that they bring far more than what they cost when it comes to that cut that they take. And especially for products that are physical products, I think it makes a lot of sense, right? If you're building a board game and if you make accidentally 2,000 more board games than you're able to sell, that could be your entire profit margin. (laughs) Right. This warehouse, you sold 50,000 board games, but the 2,000 board games you had to pay for are sitting in a warehouse. You have to pay, you know, storage fees for them every month and it eats away at all your profits. And oh, by the way, you had to pay for those board games. And so it's what I like about Kickstarter and Indiegogo and other crowdfunding platforms is it gives you an idea of the demand for how much you need to make, which can be hard, right? Apple made that mistake with the iPhone 10. They thought it would set the world on fire. And now they're going to their manufacturers and they're like, cancel the orders. Don't make any more iPhone 10. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants it. I mean, that's not true. Right. People are just buying the iPhone 10, but they've had to cut the right. production. And it's easier for them, right? Because they're selling, you know, for them, they're selling a million, you know, a week instead of two million a week, like they thought they're able to just reduce right. the production. Right. Uh, but it's harder when you're a small operation. You don't have, you know, a hundred billion dollars in the yeah. bank. Right. Uh, And having that money ahead of time and that knowledge of how much to make is really helpful. Yeah. If you build WordPress websites, you should join your fellow WordPress developers from around the world for WordSesh, a must-attend virtual conference on July 25th, 2018. WordSesh has been highly curated to provide you with the absolute best possible experience. Every presenter has been handpicked for their experience and perspective. Each topic complements and builds on the others, and the virtual swag will be amazing and useful. You can see the full speaker lineup and register for the live event and its recordings at wordsesh.com. Wow, that's really some really great points, right? Because I've I have a Patreon, it's okay. Like I just revamped the rewards, you know, more rewarding rewards. And somebody asked, like, how come I'm not using GiveWP? I love the people at Give. Like they are amazing, they're super supportive. They've been on the show, but Patreon gives that third-party validation, right? They tell people how many other people are backing. I don't have to support any kind of infrastructure, and it puts me in front of an audience that maybe I wouldn't otherwise be in front of. And don't underestimate the power of having people's credit cards on file. So I back a bunch of different people on Patreon. After you back your first person on Patreon, backing your second person is really easy. Once you've backed your first Kickstarter campaign, they already have your credit card on file. You know, it's like buying something on Amazon. Once Amazon gets your credit card number, it's one click and you're done. Everywhere else is two clicks because of the patent. Right. But that's way less than, oh, I'm on your private website and I have to decide if I trust your encryption and your security. And then I have right. to go downstairs and get my credit card and type it in and get, you know, that's a lot of hassle. And having a site that already has all of that information on file you get to participate in that community. But there's, um, you know, GiveWP is, is a great platform as well, and, and what they're doing is a good thing. But there is some benefit in being a part of that ecosystem. And yeah. also, people know what a Patreon is now. 
more than they did three years ago, right? You watch every popular YouTube person now is promoting Patreon. And, you know, a lot of popular podcasters are. And there's some really powerful, you can have um, special Patreon, you know, RSS feeds. Right. So a listeners only episode or Q&A episode. And it makes that really easy to do. I'm a big fan of crowdfunding in general. And the platforms all have something good about them. Even Indiegogo. I've done a couple of campaigns on Indiegogo. And they have some cool things about them, too. Nice. Very nice. Yep. And then you're absolutely right. At the end of this episode, listeners will hear my pitch for Patreon. Uh, you know, hear like behind the scenes interviews and extra stuff. And, and you know, that's that's what I'm driving at. Right. So very cool. So let's get to the title question, because, man, we've been already talking for a half hour. Maybe there'll be a bonus episode on, on Patreon. So how how did you build the campaign? I guess we talked a little bit about this. Maybe we could talk about, you know, like building the campaign in conjunction with building the plugin. You know, were you did you say we're not going to touch this until we are funded or were you like at some point? Well, it looks like we'll probably get funded. We might as well get a head start. You know, like what was the decision making like there? So Kickstarter requires you to have a prototype okay. for your product to launch it. Now, they are not very specific as to what constitutes a prototype. For some people, that's just like a pencil drawing of what it is that they're designing. Uh, For other people, it's like we have a glitchy, buggy version of the software we're ultimately going to have, which is kind of what we had. We had a we were at early alpha stage. But what's really powerful about Kickstarter and doing things crowdfunding in general is it's a great way to validate your ideas in a lean startup way. And so in a sense, you're building the marketing for the product before you build the product itself. And it allows you to see which features people really get excited about. Because you, you're you building this great thing, those of you listening, and it's got all these bells and whistles. But you don't know is which of the features of the product that you're building actually appeal to your users. I remember being at a, a WordCamp, and somebody from Automatic was giving a presentation about the next version of WordPress. And he's mentioning a technical feature after technical feature. And people are nodding, and they're smiling. And then he talks about how they're improving copy and paste from Microsoft Word. And he gets like a standing ovation. Everyone freaks out. And he's just mm-hmm. dumbfounded. He's like, that's the feature that y'all are excited about? (laughs) Better copy and paste from Microsoft Word? But the reality was, back in the day, copying and pasting from Word is something you do all the time as a WordPress user. And it was a terrible experience because Word would bring in all this weird code. It was messed up your pages. And, you know, they knew that it was an important thing. But I don't think he fully appreciated just, like, how passionate his users were. And with if you're crowdfunding a project, you're able to see what people are passionate about ahead of time especially with stretch goals and with feedback. Uh, What a lot of uh, campaigns will do, and I'm a big fan of this, is surveying your users. So a comment, if you're doing a physical product, it comes in white, right? But the stretch goal is it's going to come in another color or three Mm -hmm. additional colors. Well, you don't pick the colors. You say, hey, fans, what colors do you want? Or it's going to work with the iPhone. And if we hit a stretch goal, it's going to work with an Android phone. Which Android phone do you want us to pick? And gotcha. suddenly you're get, you're and you're and not getting feedback from like random people on the internet. You're getting feedback from people who've given you money already. <laughs> These are like right, people right. who are actual customers. And it makes the development a lot more successful. And it also reduces the cost of failure. So, in fact, we made this mistake. There was a product that we put together for professional speakers called My Speaking Page. And what I should have done is put the actual cost of the plugin, which was probably $5,000 to develop. Instead, put about $2,500 goal, same as we had for My Book Table. But with this one, we were building it from scratch. And I think we had every professional speaker who was in the market for this plugin, back the plugin. There was about a hundred of them. <laughs> we still have a hundred happy speakers using it. And the problem was, and we didn't realize this at the time, is that the window of speakers who want an event calendar on their website is really narrow. Most mm-hmm. professional speakers aren't giving enough, aren't doing enough speaking right. to want that. And the ones who are doing enough speaking to want that, most of them have like people to handle their website for them. Right. What we had built was a solution to a problem that no one really had. And what we should have done is had the realistic goal, and then we could have failed very inexpensively. We posted the campaign online, yeah. failed to fund, which is one of the brilliant things about my uh, about Kickstarter. It's all or nothing. So you're not stuck being on the hook if you're trying to develop this big, expensive product, and you fail to raise the money to make the product. You don't have to raise the money. Those people's credit cards are not charged, and you're right. not obligated to make the plug-in. And, man, that is way better. <laughs> Trust me, as somebody who's been there, 
you know, I succeeded in a Kickstarter that should have failed. <laughs> I would yeah, have yeah. Been much happier now if that campaign had failed to fund. I wouldn't have gotten the twenty five hundred dollars, and I wouldn't have spent the five thousand dollars making a really great solution to a problem that only a hundred people had. Now I'll say. For those 100 people, they love the plugin. <laughs> they are still using it because it precisely fits just their problem, but we identified too small of a niche. And we could have found that out very inexpensively with Kickstarter if we weren't quite so optimistic about the future. Right. And I, that's a great point, right? You're not on the hook. With Patreon, right, you kind of are. Like for a while, I had one backer at like the $10 level. And I'm like, well, I'm not going to create like brand new weekly content for 10 bucks a month. But like, I'm still beholden to that person who is pledging their money and they're supporting me. So it's, it's, it's an interesting grind. And I know that we are coming up on time. I want to ask the last couple of questions I normally ask, but I'm wondering if you will stick around for an extra couple minutes for a bonus episode. Tell me like your top five tips for a successful Kickstarter. So if you're listening and you want to start a Kickstarter, head over to patreon.com slash how I built it. But I do want to ask as far as let's talk about your plugin specifically here, since you've now had a couple of Kickstarters to fund it. Uh, what are the big transformations from, let's say, the first Kickstarter campaign to the most recent? and what does it look like for 4.0? Are you going to kickstart that? You know, what are your plans for the future? The biggest surprise with plugin development, and this totally blindsided us, and it's because I'm an American and I have a very American centric view on the world, <laughs> but it is that people use WordPress in other countries. <laughs> uh, so when we launched my book table one, we had no thought to internationalization. We didn't think about it or consider it at all. And that was a huge mistake because half of the WordPress user base are in other countries. Now, a lot of those other countries are English-based countries, so like the UK or South Africa. But a lot of them are in Japan and Italy and Germany. And so one of the things we've been doing, uh, and we're still working on this, we're most of the way there, though, is making the plugin where it's easily translated into other languages. And what's been cool is that you know, somebody will buy our plugin or download it and use the free version and they will translate it. And sometimes they'll send us the translation file and then we're able to then have it translated for everyone else. And so we've been slowly adding translations and it's fun to see, oh, here's somebody using my book table in Italy. I have no yeah. idea what any of these books are about, but he sure does have a lot of them on his website. <laughs> I think this one's romance. <laughs> <laughs> I can't read Italian and Google Translate's not doing great on this page, but, uh, you know, he's happily using my book table. And just this week, I've been interacting with somebody who's, you know, doing this, my book table in Japanese. And I really can't tell what's going on on that side. Wow. Like it, it's totally foreign language to me. And that's been a challenge of kind of figuring out how do you support people who are in other languages? Like, like we don't offer Japanese support. So they're, contacting us in English, but their English is not very good. So it's like a reverse right. version of what happens when you call tech support and they're in India. And their English <laughs> is not very good, except we're yeah. the ones who are the native speakers and then we're trying to help people who aren't. Yeah, uh, yeah. And that, that's been a, a real challenge. My book table four, right now we're still working on our like dot releases. So a lot of mm -hmm. the features we're just rolling out for free for our 3.0 folks. The big thing that we're watching very closely is the effect of Gutenberg on our plugin. So for those gotcha. who don't know, Gutenberg is this big new WordPress 5.0 update that's going to really change how you edit WordPress pages. And it's going to have an impact on our plugin. Right. Our hope I, is for I, the better. Yeah, I will say, like, at the time of this recording, it's in development. By the time this recording comes out, Gutenberg could also, like, it just could be... 5.0 might be out. So you might be experiencing that already. Yeah, I heard Matt Mel Mullenweg say that it will be out in April. If that <laughs> happens, I will be very surprised. <laughs> I, I'm expecting Gutenberg to arrive in late, late 2018. Gotcha. November yeah. or December. They're wanting it to land in April. They never launch on time, hardly ever, especially <laughs> with a big project like this. But um, right. So that's that's the big kind of elephant is being compatible with Gutenberg and knowing when they're kind of done or like we're finished coding Gutenberg. And so now we work to make it compatible. But uh, a lot of it is just adapting to the changing world. When we launched my book table five years ago, the number the bookstores that people used online were very different. You know, several of the ebook stores have gone out of business. <laughs> There's whole new ones that have emerged, and so that's a big thing that we're doing is we're constantly having to adapt to this changing publishing landscape. Of wow. you know, authors are different now. Authors, the ones who are making money, are writing more books, and they're writing books faster, and so they're more in need mm -hmm. of a plugin like my book table. So those are the big features uh, that we're looking at. We don't have uh, plans for 4.0 anytime soon, though. Gotcha. Cool. Uh, that's really interesting. 
maybe we can dig into that a little bit in the extended episode too. But I do want to, we are at time, so I do want to ask you my favorite question, which is, do you have any trade secrets for us? Trade secrets. So this isn't really a secret, except it is, sadly, because no one really knows it, but it's the WordPress philosophy. So it's buried on WordPress.org somewhere. But believe it or not, WordPress philosophy is like the secret to creating amazing code. So WordPress won the war for internet dominance. It runs the most number of websites of any platform. It accidentally became the number two player in e-commerce. And if you want to know how WordPress did it, there's this manifesto. It's a one-page manifesto. I'm pretty sure Matt Mullen Meg wrote it one time. It was never edited. But it's brilliant. And we follow that WordPress philosophy very closely with our plugin. And we find that it's a really great programming philosophy. There are other good programming philosophies, but we find that decisions not at, you know, options and, you know, code is poetry and, you know, ignoring the vocal minority is really important, right? Like those two people who really want you to make the plugin more complicated to accommodate their special need really need to be ignored, even if they're making a lot of noise, because adding that complexity hurts everyone. And and it's not that different from the Apple philosophy. Like as you read the WordPress philosophy, you'll see, oh, this is similar. Like I can see this inf- this sort of thinking influenced Apple products as well. And just ha- even if you disagree with it, having read it, you can at least start having that conversation in your mind as to like how to approach code, how to approach themes, uh, how to approach plugins, or any other kind of product. I think the WordPress philosophy applies even to writing a book. It's a great philosophy. Man, that's great. I love that. I'm going to link that in the show notes. And it's really cool because it also kind of gives you some insight into, you know, Matt has been catching a lot of flack for Gutenberg and other decisions that he's making at Automatic and and as, as the CEO and stuff like that and on the open source project. But I mean, it falls in line with the WordPress philosophy. He really believes in what he's doing. And I mean, as we record this, you know, WordPress is powering 30% of the web, right? So, you know, it's he's definitely doing something right. So I have a yeah. lot of respect for, for Matt Mullenweg. I watched his State of the Word address, and he's <laughs> addressing a room full of people who don't like him at the moment. And right. he dedicates an hour to question and answers where he lets people ask their hardest questions. I'm like, I have a lot of respect for him. And ultimately, I agree with the direction. You can't ever decide that the developers are more important than the users. And right. this change with Gutenberg is saying that 60-year-old lady who wants to have a blog, her needs are more important because the developer can accommodate himself or herself to these changes much easier than this new internet user can. And ultimately, if we can make new users' lives better, that's what's going to make the platform succeed. And, and I'll say for those of you who are Patreon backers for Joe, I have a course on Kickstarter, like how to crowdfund a product, and I'll have an exclusive discount for the folks who get the bonus episode. <laughs> so, oh, look so at that. some bonus that. content. <laughs> Very nice. Well, I love that. I had a thought, but I want to close on that. So... Thomas, thank you so much for joining me for part one. If you want to hear part two, if you want to get some great information on starting your own Kickstarter project and you want a little uh, bonus, uh, a little special offer for Thomas's course, head over to patreon.com slash how I built it for part two. But uh, until then, Thomas, thanks so much for joining me. I appreciate your time. Where can people find you? You can find more about our plugins at authormedia.com. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I apologize for the uh, lackluster audio there. I had just redid my setup and made the rookie mistake of forgetting to check my inputs. Uh, But hopefully the great content made up for it. And I'm telling you, that part two over at Patreon is absolutely worth the price of admission. Uh, I know that I'm going to start integrating some of that stuff today. So uh, thanks again, Thomas, for joining me. Um, it, it's uh, I appreciate the extra time, too, uh, over on Patreon. It's a top five list, and uh, there are lots of actionable items. So uh, thanks again to our sponsors. Uh, make sure to check them out as well. Uh, Liquid Web for managed hosting. I use them on all of my important sites because they are that good. Uh, they are over at buildpodcast.net slash liquid. And they'll give you 50% off your first two months just for being a listener. If you want to save your clients or yourself money through recovering abandoned carts, check out Jilt. They're over at buildpodcast.net slash Jilt. And finally, be sure to check out WordSash on July 25th. 
It's an incredibly affordable 12-hour online conference with some of the biggest thought leaders in WordPress. Get your tickets at buildpodcast.net slash wordsesh. For all of the show notes, head over to howibuilt.it slash 80, episode 80, crazy. If you like the show, head over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a rating and review. Uh, And if you like the show and you want to support it directly, head over to patreon.com slash howibuiltit. We've got that bonus episode uh, and we've got a t-shirt pre-sale going on. So definitely check all of that out. And until next time, get out there and build something.